This is a weird one. Checkin' Out feels like the Season 3 equivalent of The Squashening, in the sense that it contains three individual stories told from the perspective of each of the three Powerpuff Girls regarding their experiences while shopping at a grocery store. Obviously, another apt comparison could be to The Bare Facts from the original, although only Buttercup's segment gets any sort of stylistic change in the visuals department. Blossom and Bubbles' stories certainly take place in different settings, but the overall look of their sequences aren't any different from the regular appearance of the episodes. Now, it's important to make the distinction that unlike the squashing, which told each of the girls' stories in order, one at a time, this one actually plays around a lot with simultaneous and parallel edit as the episode tends to cut back and forth between all three stories quite frequently here. It makes sense logically speaking, seeing as all three events are meant to be taking place at the same time. However, for the sake of simplicity and me not wanting my review to feel like it's all over the place, constantly rushing back and forth between all three of these subplots, I think instead I'm just going to review each segment here one at a time instead of worrying about trying to pace this review amidst all of the cutting that's taking place. This would be a very chaotic review if I kept having to go, Buttercup does this thing, then Bubbles takes two step forwards, followed by a cut to Blossom who's dealing with her problem, which gets interrupted by Buttercup who is busy doing this other thing now that she's here, and then we go back to Blossom while Bubbles still is in this place. Yeah, I think it'll just be easier to cover each individual story one at a time. That said, let's check out Checkin' Out. <laughs> Humans have 24 hours to make us a nice dinner. A nice dinner? As that clip just displayed, we first cut to a giant gathering of UFOs that have arrived in Townsville demanding the Powerpuff Girls to prepare the finest cuisine their culture has to offer, or else they will destroy the entire planet. I'm not sure why these aliens want Earth food so badly, but we barely spend any time with them to really understand why they're here and why they want Earth sustenance so badly. But knowing their request, the girls head on over to the fanciest supermarket in town, Savings Pig. The show didn't even use Clumpkins, which I thought was a prime opportunity to tie into the gift and create some more cohesiveness with the world. But really, Penguin Pete's and the Snooty Rose are like the only two recurring store slash restaurants in the entire series. Everything else just pops up on an episode to episode basis. Considering aliens are involved, wouldn't this be the perfect opportunity to invoke the help of Bliss? I'd say yes if this episode were following a different plot, but she really doesn't have any place in this narrative because cramming in a fourth story amidst the already chaotic parallel stories that are taking place would make this episode even more cluttered than it already is. But as the episode demands, the girls go shopping at this savings pig grocery store and gather all of the items they need aside from two. Jelly and cereal. How the girls were able to get the other dozens of items without any issue is a mystery to me considering what happens next, because the rest of the episode is Buttercup striving to get the jelly, Bubbles striving to get the cereal, and Blossom striving to not have a breakdown while waiting in line. Seeing as the episode branches off with Buttercup's story first, I think I'll begin there too. So as I had mentioned, Blossom tasks Buttercup with acquiring the jelly, and once she goes off on her own, she presents the audience with a film noir style of presentation as she employs all of the tropes that one would expect from that genre of cinema. Reciting in her monologues as she explains her current situation, lots of heavy blacks and whites, a somber background track to set the mood, the typical tropes. This all starts with her her being unable to find any jelly on the shelf, however, so it's not like this form of storytelling is completely out of left field. It does become a mystery of sorts that Buttercup needs to solve if they're to make this alien's full course meal, and she does so by playing the role of the detective. Mustard, mayo, jelly butter, jelly sauce, jelly mayo? Ah, come on! I'm just looking for plain old jelly! Gotta say, I don't know what company that is, but that's a very confusing and non-recognizable name for a condiment company. They are pretty much doomed to fail, economically speaking. Her first task is to get some information, so she finds this local worker who's currently stocking shelves and questions him on where the jelly has been relocated to. This guy is pretty cooperative actually, despite what his facial expression would imply, and tells her to check aisle 64 after she bribes him with a jawbreaker, and now I'm suddenly in the mood to watch Ed, Ed, and Eddie. You promised me a jawbreaker, you crooked copper! Jawbreaker, huh? Coming right up! 
Oh, well that wasn't very nice. I mean, the dude barely put up a fuss, all things considered. Why'd she have to go and smash it in his face? He didn't even put up any resistance when she questioned him. But I guess this is to be expected from the green-eyed jerk face. Eventually, she finds this alleyway that has a door marked with the number 64 on it, where she's greeted by some stranger behind said door. I'm a little confused as to how this transfers into reality because I don't know of an aisle that would have Jelly locked behind a door unless she's in the back of the store, or the person behind the door is locked in with Jelly in a freezer. But Jelly usually isn't kept in a freezer? Well, she demands to be allowed access in order to acquire some of that delicious grape jelly, but the door slams open in her face and the mysterious figure in a trench coat goes running in the other direction to try and escape. And this is where we get the big reveal. Let's see who you really are. Big peanut butter? Yeah, you got me, gumshoe. Yeah, okay, I'm lost. As indicated by Buttercup's interrogation of the store worker, Buttercup's point of view is paralleling the real events that are taking place, just through a different lens. So what does a giant talking jar of peanut butter translate to and why would he be restricting Buttercup's access to the jelly? Now, I think there could be an argument made where this could be the manager of the store, but the store worker still looked the same in the noir sequence as a human, so that's why I'm a little confused. Buttercup also ends up beating up these cronies that the giant jar sicks on her, who could also be implied to be other employees, but they also have a human appearance, so I'm really not sure what this jar is translating to, and if it were to be the store manager, what is compelling him to run off with a jar of jelly and advocate so hard for using peanut butter in the recipe instead? It was a trap. Of course it was a trap, and I fell for it like an elevator full of dumbbells. Uh -oh. This part just comes out of nowhere and is extremely weird compared to the rest of Buttercup's story. But her plot comes to an end with her sitting down and yelling no for an extended period of time instead of just flying over towards the jelly the instant she sees it falling, and thus it breaks on the ground and the jelly is ruined. <laughs> As I said, she could have easily saved that thing, but she instead decided to just sit there, stick her arm out, and yell no, in an overdramatic way. Now the question is, why didn't she just get another jar? Next up, it's Bubbles' turn. So after Buttercup rushes off, Blossom tasks Bubbles with acquiring a box of cereal for their recipe, although she doesn't specify which type or brand, otherwise Bubbles wouldn't really have any conflict to deal with. This, of course, leads Blossom to put all of the pressure on Bubbles in making that decision for her. You know, you'd think Blossom would want to be the one to meticulously pick the best cereal for the recipe instead of leaving her sister to do it, considering she's such an organized neat freak, and Bubbles probably wouldn't put the same logic and reasoning into the decision that she would anyways, but no, this is Bubbles' story, so that's what we're gonna go with, even though it doesn't really have any significant changes in art style, as I mentioned during the introduction. Kind of a missed opportunity and inconsistent, considering that Buttercup's side of things did get an art style change, whereas Bubbles doesn't. She does at least get different colorful backgrounds, but that's not quite the same thing. Oh, and go figure that Buttercup would be the one to get the special art style while the other two didn't. Is anyone else surprised at this point? And so, Bubbles wanders off to the cereal aisle and sees all sorts of different options available. And with the power of imagination, these mascots quickly come to life and lead Bubbles to having this big dance party with all of them, akin to the likes of Milkshake Mondays, as seen in Imagine That. Here though, even more cereal mascots show up in the background for like two shots, including knockoffs of Tony the Tiger and Toucan Sam. Bubbles' story, in all honesty, is basic and uninteresting. Take us all! Take us all! Well, take us all! Eventually, she needs to make a decision amongst all of these different options as to which cereal she's going to include in the recipe, and after suffering from the immense pressure created by the figments inside her own imagination, she ultimately chooses Cherry Chimpanzees. This sparks outrage within all of the other mascots, leading them to attack her relentlessly because they're offended that they weren't the ones chosen. And I'm not gonna lie, the dark mood change is really sudden but effective in illustrating the anxiety rising within Bubbles' mind now that she's questioning her own decision. It's a good way of representing her doubt. How dare you deny our rainbow deliciousness? Get the 
easily, brat. What's weird to me, though, is that none of these brands showed any animosity towards their competition during all of this, as it feels like no matter which choice Bubbles was going to go with, they would have gotten mad at her anyways, so why get upset at her when they should really be fighting each other for attention over the other competitors? But hey, I get how this is a representation of the overwhelming pressure placed on her to make a decision that has the fate of the human race at stake. Yet, yeah, don't forget, this entire episode is driven by the fact that aliens are invading Townsville, remember? There aren't any cool space battles or alien fights. Nope, instead the girls go to the supermarket. Again, I emphasize the importance of how this series misses the entire point of what a superhero show is meant to be. In the end, she ends up finding this milk hose and douses all of the other mascots in milk, causing them to melt and deteriorate into a disgusting, grimy mess, which allows her to escape with her cereal of choice. This, in turn, brings Bubbles' story to a close, meaning we can move on to what happened with Blossom, while this and Buttercup's film noir were both going down. So after leaving her sisters to their tasks, Blossom rolls the cart on over to the express checkout lane, which for whatever reason has a max capacity of 100 115 items, as opposed to the usual 10 or 20 or so. But that's not even the real problem here. The problem is that this older woman is in the express checkout lane with 116 items meaning she's over the allowed limit and thus should not be attempting to pay in this lane. Blossom, being the overly pedantic rules enforcer that she is, demands one of the workers to do something about it, but because one extra item really isn't something worth getting upset over, they just shrug her off. Ma'am! That woman has 116 items in the express checkout line! Take her away! Not my department. So this then suddenly turns into a medieval fantasy in which Blossom imagines herself as Lady Blossom. Yeah, creative name. A knight with her trusty steed Copernicus, who goes to take down the 116 item witch that blocks the poor peasant's path. None shall pass! Oh please, which of the 116 items? Please let us pass. I only have four kinds. I only got one roll of toilet paper! Yeah, I mean there is a point to be made about the people who have like 100 items but won't let somebody with a handful of 4 or 5 in front of them, but that isn't the case considering that Blossom as well as the customers in front of her both have shopping carts full of groceries. This person in her imagination doesn't actually exist in reality, so I'm just saying she's making the woman out to be worse than she really is. Besides, the actual woman isn't even doing anything wrong. She probably didn't even know she had one extra item, so really this is just Blossom losing her shit over something menial. Why would I want to root for her in this daydream of hers exactly? Well, pretty soon a battle breaks out where the witch throws a bunch of her 116 items at Blossom, who slices and dices through them whilst random cards are placed in between shots for some reason. Ham Sandwich why this is, I have no idea, but what I can say is eventually Blossom wears her down to the point of not having any items left to throw, thus ultimately saving the day and beating her up a bunch to teach her a lesson. Blossom's fantasy truly is my least favorite of the three, if only because nothing really happens, nor is it justified in the same way that the peer pressure Bubbles faces or the accident Buttercup encounters causes them to freak out. Sure, Bubbles' is kind of pointless too, but Blossom is literally just being pedantic over a minor offense that nobody else would even be bothered by and starts physically attacking this woman over it. At least Bubbles' story had the backgrounds going for it. This is just a diluted yellow and a hill without much else. Yeah, undoubtedly the weakest of the three. Get out. Okay, so now Mr. Peanut Butter being the manager is out the window because this guy is a completely different voice and doesn't really look like him either aside from the mustache, kinda. So yeah, definitely not sure what to make of Buttercup's fantasy there. But the store manager kicks them out and the girls don't get to have any of the food they put in their cart, so they just head home empty handed. I feel like something of this proportion could warrant Oh, I don't know, telling the mayor of the city that this is going on, or perhaps contacting the manager ahead of time and informing him of the current circumstances. Even if he didn't allow the girls to get what they needed, they could have just brought the alien to him or brought him to the alien to show proof. I don't know, this is a situation where the girls should have had the right to go through the store and get what they needed, if they were willing to pay for it fairly, of course, and it just isn't there. The girls could have done something awesome here, but it's squandered completely. I find that this episode 
episode perfectly showcases what the reboot truly is. What do the girls do when aliens attempt to invade their planet? They go grocery shopping, because that's the logical solution, right? That's the kind of show this is. I know I'm a broken record at this point because we've known this in season one, but I really do like to reiterate this because it shows that nothing changed. Yeah, kids totally want to watch the Powerpuff Girls go grocery shopping. It's their all-time favorite activity. Like, really? When I was a kid, I hated going shopping. In fact, I still do. But the episode ends with the girls slapping together some old cereal they found in their cupboard and an orange. And because of course it does, the alien loves the food and claims it is the finest cuisine he has ever tasted, thus ending the episode. And this crunchy thing on the bottom, what do you call it? Uh, the plate? Delicious. Uh, did we just get away with that? Yup. Why, yes, it appears you did. You can thank the convenient writing for that one. And could the ending of the episode have been any more sudden? Well, I suppose In the Doghouse has it topped, but not by much. Not gonna lie, I checked out a Checkin' Out the first time I checked it out, but when I went to check it out again for this review, Checkin' Out left me more confused than ever before, so honestly, I'd say Checkin' Out ain't worth checking out in my opinion. I just personally didn't see how this was an improvement over the other three mini-story episodes we've seen before, like The Squashening, The Secret Life of Blossom, or even Splitsville. To be fair, we haven't had a single episode of this type at all this season, but it still leaves a lot to be desired. Perhaps if Blossom's fantasy were more interesting and justified, and both hers and Bubbles's had more unique presentations to it the way that Buttercups did, I would have enjoyed it more, but as it stands, it just feels like it got halfway there and then stopped trying. Oh well, that's gonna do it for this week's episode. Now, I'm checking out.